The Era of Good Feelings, 1816 to 1828. This lecture focuses on the dual effects of nationalism and sectionalism following the War of 1812. It opens up by looking at how nationalism is expressed in economic policy, and particularly the debates over the National Bank, the financing of internal improvements, and court decisions made by the Marshall Court. The lecture also considers the debate over Henry Clay's American system and goes on to examine the expressions of sectionalism in the era. It follows the shifting political party patterns from Monroe's attempt to get rid of a party system up to transformations within the Democrat and Whig parties. The lecture outlines the era of good feelings, its collapse with the Panic of 1819 and the Missouri Compromise of 1820. The following sections discuss the significance of the Monroe Doctrine and the survey of Adams' presidency, and will conclude with the discussion in the rise and election of Andrew Jackson in 1828. New Nationalism Jefferson's embargo had forced Americans to look inward for the production of their finished goods. This led to the first American Industrial Revolution and a surge of economic growth. Madison now supported a larger army and navy and a new national bank and the tariffs to protect American industry against foreign competition. The charter of the first bank of the United States had ended in 1811 and was not immediately renewed. Without the financial control that the central bank represented, economic turmoil ensued. With the help of Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun, Congress established a new national bank in order to stabilize the national currency and promote economic growth. The bank would handle all federal funds without charges and up to $5 million on demand. The issue would also set a pattern of regional alignment for most of the economic issues. Clay introduced a banking bill and pushed it through, justifying the constitutionality because the Congress's power to regulate currency. Flip-flopping, Clay first supposed, supposed the National Bank now argued for it. Webster, who had opposed it, due to the fear of the growing financial power of Philadelphia, would then return to Congress for much stronger national government. Calhoun, who favored economic nationalism, would later on become a straight rights advocate. To protect the fledging American industrial sector from competing British imports, the Tariff of 1816 was enacted. The North, where most of the manufacturing base was located, was for it. The South was against it. The agrarian economy of the South still depended on shipping goods abroad to agents who in turn sold them and purchased items requested by the owners and shipped them back. Southerners were upset because this forced them to pay this tax. Now, the War of 1812 had highlighted several shortcomings of the United States. One of these was the need for better transportation systems and the construction of roads, bridges, canals, and harbors. The nation needed a network of roads running east to west, which also include a national road that connected the Midwest with the east. Calhoun argued that for eternal improvements in 1817, believing that a national road would help the South support income from the West badly needed transportation infrastructure, opposition from New England, which would gain the least from the projects. Judicial Nationalism A pillar of judicial nationalism, John C. Marshall was appointed Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court at the age of 46. He ruled on Marbury v. Madison two years later. During his tenure on the bench as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Marshall extended the powers of the Supreme Court to provide a more nationalistic role of the federal government in states' affairs such as Marbury v. Madison in 1803, where he established judicial review. That is the court's ability to declare a federal law unconstitutional. Both Martin v. Hunter, Lease, 1816, and Collins v. Virginia, 1821, reinforced this ruling. Protecting contract rights was Dartmouth College v. Woodward in 1819. In 1816, the Republicans dominated New Hampshire legislature and altered the charter 
1869 at Dartmouth College, which he administrated to a state-appointed board of trustees. The old board of trustees sued the secretary of the university, asserting that the legislative act was unconstitutional in violation of the obligation of contracts. After the state court upheld the legislature, the Supreme Court under Marshall held that the charter constituted a contract, ruling the legislative act unconstitutional. The decision placed charters of existing private corporations outside the jurisdictions of states that chartered them. This encouraged business growth, but led to abuse of corporate privileges. Marshall's decision removed the power of the state to modify contracts as well. Protecting national currency. The relationship between the state and the federal government was forever changed when Marshall delivered the majority ruling in McCulloch v. Maryland in 1819. The legislature of Maryland passed a law aimed at the Second Bank of the United States. All banks not chartered by the state were required to comply with restrictions concerning note issues or pay an annual tax of $15,000. When the Baltimore branch ignored the law, claiming that it was unconstitutional, the state rule sued the cashier of the bank, James W. McCulloch. Two issues were at stake. First, was the act of Congress establishing the National Bank constitutional? Second, was the state tax on the bank constitutional? Marshall ruled that a clause in Article I, Section 8, was purposely left vague to allow Congress to create necessary and proper entities. The powers of the national government were derived from the people and an exercise directly on them effectively, stating that the doctrine of loose construction, although the federal government is limited in its powers, it is supreme in its sphere of action. The government must have the suitable and effective means of execute the power it has. It also denied that states could tax the bank because the power to tax is the power to destroy. Regulating interstate commerce in Gibbon v. Ogden, 1824. In 1807, Robert Fulton successfully invented a practical steam propelled craft which operated up the Hudson at the speed prescribed by New York law and obtained a monopoly of steam navigation on the state's waters. Many challenged monopoly, which led to litigation. One challenge involved Aaron Ogden, who was a state-required Fulton Livingston license, and Thomas Gibbons, who had a federal coasting license and ran a competing boating line between New Jersey and Manhattan. New York courts upheld the state monopoly given to Ogden under Fulton Livingston. Webster, speaking for Gibson, interpreted commercial broadly and argued that the states had concurrent power over com commerce between the states. Marshall, speaking for the court, defined commerce expansively beyond more mere exchange of goods to include persons and steamboats. Concurring Justice William Johnson, a nationalist from South Carolina, added that the power to regulate interstate commerce was the exclusive right of the national government. Congress is supreme in all aspects of interstate commerce over the state powers, which could not limit Congress. Marshall exerted the right of a nation to regulate commerce over the right of states, whereas states had the right to regulate intrastate within the state commerce. The federal government had maintained the right to regulate interstate between states and commerce. Debates over the American system. Henry Clay of Kentucky, as you see in the painting there, entered the Senate at the age 28, despite the requirement the senators be at least 30 years of age. The internal improvements in the creation of industrial infrastructure and the stabilizing of the American colony followed the War of 1812, have been described as the American system. They also called for a more active role of the federal government in the lives of its citizens. The first proponent of the American system was Henry Clay. To win support for a protective tariff in 1824, Clay defied an American system. It contained the protective tariff with a national system of internal improvements to expand the domestic market 
and lessen U.S. dependence on overseas sources. And the tariff of 1824 included high duties on imported agricultural goods such as hemp, wheat, and liquor to protect Western farmers and imported textiles to protect New England interests and iron to protect mining and foraging industries of Pennsylvania. South Carolina had been particularly hard hit by the Depression of 1819. The tariff also increased the prices of their import goods by as much as 50%. South Carolina asserted that the tariffs were unfair as a tax on Southern agriculture for the benefit of Northern industry. It increased protection on iron, lead, glass, hemp, and cotton bagging, but raised the 25% minimum on cotton on woolens to 33.3% and advanced to raw wool by 15%. To convince Western states to support the tariff, Clay called for the federal government to use the revenues to build much needed infrastructure, roads, bridges, canals, and other internal improvements. The American system would raise prices for federal land sold to the public and the revenues raised from these sales would go to the states to help finance internal improvements. Clay also was in favor of a strong national bank to regulate the national currency. In order for the system to work, each region would have to compromise. Critics argued that the tariffs benefit northern manufacturing sectors at the expense of southern and western farmers. Many western and southern farmers did not like the second bank of the U.S., believing that it would become so powerful and corrupt that it would dictate the national economic future of the expense of states' rights. An Error of Good Feelings Because of the demise of the Federalist Party, only the Democratic Republicans remain a viable party. President Monroe toured the eastern seaboard north of Baltimore and as far west as Detroit as a symbol of the triumph of the national feeling over party animosity. Americans, especially in New England, warmly would see the president so that the Boston Columbian Sentinel referred it to the Times as the era of good feelings. The designation is superficial and misleading because the seeds of sectionalism were already sown during this administration. Although no formal political parties existed, new party factions arose during this period and new controversies were created as magnified by the circumstances surrounding the election of 1824. In Monroe's inaugural address, he revealed the extent on which Republicans had embraced the Federalist positions, including a standing army, adequate navy, and government protection of manufacturing. He continued the Virginia dynasty of early American presidents. Monroe followed Madison, becoming another citizen of Virginia to be elected to the nation's highest office. Moreau had served as Secretary of State of War to James Madison. The Panic of 1819 Americans enjoyed a wave of prosperity between 1815 and 1818 that fueled land speculation and credit among rising crop prices. Reduced demand for cotton and food in Europe led to a credit contraction that caused a sharp decline in commodity prices and real estate values. The Panic of 1819 was initiated by the fall in cotton prices after a period of prosperity due to the British textile mills refusing to purchase high-priced American cotton. The Bank of the United States stopped all loans and called in debts, stimulating a depression that hit the West the hardest. Inflation, wild land speculation, overextended investments in manufacturing, mismanagement of the Second Bank of the U.S. and the collapse of the foreign markets, and the contraction of credit led to the first real American economic depression. State banks, in order to generate loans, issued even more paper money. Specie payments strained the resources of the state banks and caused failures and hardships for debtors, especially in the Southwest. Congress would cancel the easy credit terms of the land law of 1800. Squatters often settled on land and improved government land, but that was not yet for sale, and widespread resentment against the National Bank was created in the West.
The Missouri Compromise of 1820. Following the Revolution, the United States had followed an alternating pattern of admitting states into the Union, one slave state and then one free state. At the time of Missouri's request to be admitted, there were 22 states, 11 free and 11 slave. Now, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 had dictated there were to be no slave states there, but no such policy existed for states emerging from the Louisiana Purchase. Both Missouri and Maine applied for the statehood by the end of 1819 when the U.S. had 11 slave states, which were Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, and 11 free states, which included Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Vermont, New Hampshire, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. While the slaveholding South had 81 votes in the House, to the North's 105, a political balance was maintained in the Senate. And between 1802 and 1819, by amending alternating a free and a slave state, the population in the North was growing at a faster rate than the population in the South, and the South realized that its political future lay in the Senate. The Talmadge Amendment. Representative James Talmadge in New York introduced a bill that prohibited further introducing slaves into the Upper Louisiana Territory and freed at age 25 all children born of slaves in Missouri after statehood. The amendment passed the House, but failed in the Senate. The dispute over the admission of Missouri as a slave state increased northern resentment over the expansion of slavery and southern dominance in national affairs. The congressional stalemate was finally brokered by a compromise engineered by Henry Clay that admitted Missouri to the Union as a slave state. It also brought balance to the Senate by admitting a Maine as a free state. Slavery then was prohibited north of the southern boundary of Missouri of 36 degrees 30 minutes north latitude. The sectional compromise in Congress in 1820 that admitted Missouri to the Union as a slave state, Maine as a free state, and prohibited slavery north of Louisiana Purchase. The Missouri Compromise attempted to claim the growing distance differences beyond the issues of slavery. Eventually, the state that had admitted an agreement had reached that no more slave states would come to the end above the 36 degrees, 30 minute parallel. Nationalist diplomacy. After the conclusion of the war in 1812, the United States never fought another war against Great Britain. In fact, over the time, the two nations grew close to one another through diplomatic means. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams negotiated several treaties that influenced the future of the United States. A new era of Anglo-American cooperation was opened with the signing of the rush bagot Agreement and the Anglo-American Accords. Under the rush bagot Agreement Treaty of 1817 between the United States and Great Britain that effectively demilitarized Great Lakes by sharply limiting the number of ships each power could station on them. In the Anglo-American Accords, a series of agreements reached in the British-American Convention of 1818 that fixed the western boundary between the United States and Canada at the 49th parallel. This allowed for the joint occupation of the Oregon country and restored to America's fishing rights off Newfoundland. Florida. The United States now stretched from the Atlantic Ocean to the Rocky Mountains, with only Spanish America keeping it from straddling the continent. However, Spain still controlled the territory of Florida and a narrow bit of land from its panhandle to the Mississippi River. This area was lawless zone that bandits and Indians frequently used as headquarters because pursuers from America legally could not follow them into the Spanish territory. The Seminole Uprising. A fort in the Spanish-held East Florida 
was built by the English during the War of 1812, had become a refuge for runaway slaves and hostile Indians. The Seminoles subsequently began raiding American settlements along the Georgia-Florida border. Because of the threat to the Georgia border, the U.S. government sent an expedition which destroyed the fort in July of 1816. In November of 1817, U.S. soldiers attacked the Seminole village of Fowltown near present-day Bainbridge, Georgia, and a battle ensued. And in retaliation, a group of Seminoles lay siege to a boat carrying reinforcements to Fort Scott on the Apalachicola River and killed 43 men, women, and children. Enter Andrew Jackson. To combat Seminoles on the Florida border, Andrew Jackson was dispatched with 2,000 troops in December of 1817 with orders to pursue hostile elements usually runaway slaves and Indians, across the border as far as the Spanish post. Jackson wrote Monroe in the re letter that if given the word that Florida was desirable to the United States, he could accomplish the tax in 60 days. When nothing was said from Washington about the letter, Jackson interpreted that it was approval and proceeded to seize several Spanish posts. The first Seminole War would arise, and Jackson would lead troops against the Seminole villages on Lake Mikoki and along the Suwannee River, destroying them as he went. In addition, he seized the Spanish military post to what is now St. Mark's and the proceeding to take the Spanish-held town of Pensacola. During the campaign, Jackson captured, court-martialed, and executed two British traitors, Alexander Arabonant and Robert and Brister, as well as Native American leader Francis the Prophet for aiding the enemy. Although British public opinion was incensed, Britain took no action. A debate in the U.S. Congress, however, led by anti-Jackson forces, especially Henry Clay in the House, produced unfavorable reports against Jackson, but no proceedings were made against him. In Southwest, however, popular approval of Jackson's Seminole campaign, which brought all of East Florida under U.S. military control, kept Monroe from taking action against Jackson. In the adams onis or Transcontinental Treaty of 1821, Jackson's raid strengthened Monroe's hand diplomatically because while Jackson moved military against Spanish Florida, Secretary of State John At Quincy Adams was negotiating with Spain's Foreign Minister Louis de Olney over the Louisiana Purchase Western Boundary. After accusing Spain of aiding and abetting hostiles against the United States and asserting that the U.S. acted in self-defense, the U.S. Minister in Madrid issued an ultimatum, either protect and control Florida or cede it to the United States. Spain's argument to relinquish its territory in Florida to the United States under the terms of the 1819 Transcontinental Treaty. Spain also surrendered all claims to the Pacific Northwest and agreed to a boundary between the Louisiana Purchase Territory and the Spanish Southwest. Continuing his diplomatic success on land issues, in 1824, Adams completed a treaty with Russia, which defined the Oregon's territory southern boundary. The Monroe Doctrine During the French Revolution, Spain had ignored its Latin American colonies, and they had rebelled against their motherland. Great Britain, although was not sympathetic to the Republican governments in the Spain's former New World provinces, it did not want to revival or an extension of Spanish or French power in the New World, hoping to keep open to British commerce the rich markets of Latin America. Secretary of State Adams believed that the United States should act alone to assert its strength and independence in order to create an American system in the Western Hemisphere. He also believed that Britain could not be trusted to be disinterested. Britain desired a U.S. renunction of plans to take Cuba in exchange for the cooperation. The French were not a threat and Britain controlled the Atlantic seas and seeing Russian designs in the Pacific as a greater threat. The Monroe Doctrine was announced the U.S. policy in an annual address to Congress in 1823. 
essentially John Quincy Adams' idea on foreign affairs in the Western Hemisphere. The Monroe Doctrine parts were the following. Non-colonization, the American continent should no longer be seen as subject of future colonization by European powers. Second, the United States was the guardian of liberty in the New World. Third, non-intervention, because the political system in the Americas was essentially different from the Europeans, the U.S. would consider it dangerous to its peace and security if any attempt by a European power to extend their political system to any point in the Western Hemisphere. The establishment of American autonomy and foreign relations. Now, in return, the U.S. would not interfere with existing colonies or dependencies of Western powers in the New World with the internal affairs of European nations, nor take part in European wars of solely foreign interests. The assertion that America would not interfere in the European internal affairs. In other words, Europe, stay out of our backyard, we'll stay out of yours. Now, the United States did not have the military power to back it up. However, Great Britain, which approached approved the decision did and at the time of its announcement the world's powers took little note of it but it would serve as the classical definition of the u.s role in international affairs although it is a major significant emerged only in the middle of the 19th century the monroe doctrine would become the cornerstone of u.s foreign policy the rise of andrew jackson when Andrew Jackson was 14 years old in 1781 during the American Revolution, a British officer with his sword left ugly scars on his head and hand, and after this event, Jackson despised the British. Jackson would earn a law license and move to Nashville, Tennessee in 1788, where he fell in love with Rachel Donaldson Robarts, who at the time was not legally divorced from her husband. Jackson had a quick temper. He was not afraid of dueling. He fought a duel against Charles Dickinson, claiming that Dickinson had not paid off a racing bet and insulted his wife. Jackson allowed Dickinson to shoot first. Dickinson shot Jackson in the chest. Jackson recovered himself, took aim, and killed Dickinson. This would be one of 32 duels Jackson was involved in. In 1796, Jackson was elected to the United States House and later to the Senate, where he served only a year before turning to Tennessee and becoming a judge. Jackson made money as an attorney, selling horses, land, and slaves. When not farming, Jackson served as a iron will commander of the Tennessee militia. Jackson was criticized by Thomas Jefferson, who said, quote, his passions are terrible. End quote. John Quincy Adams said of Jackson, he was a savage and scarcely spell, could spell his name. Jackson responded to Adams' criticism by commenting that he never trusted a man who could think only of one way to spell one word. Presidential politics. In the election of 1824, with no political party to contend against, the Democratic Republicans turned on themselves and ran four candidates for presidency. Because of the factionalism, opposition to the Congressional caucuses as a means of choosing a candidate rose, and the nominations were mostly left to state legislatures. The following were the candidates. The Tennessee legislature nominated Andy Jackson and was endorsed by a state nominating convention in Pennsylvania. The Kentucky legislator nominated Henry Clay. John Quincy Adams was nominated at a meeting in Boston, Massachusetts, and a congressional caucus, the last one to nominate a presidential candidate, met and nominated William H. Crawford. During the campaign, Crawford was virtually eliminated by a paralytic stroke in September of 1823. John C. Calhoun had allowed his candidacy to be announced in 1821 withdrew to run for vice president for both John Quincy Adams and the Jackson tickets. Discussion among Southern and Western candidates strengthened Adams' position. Adams' support of the American system brought him close to Clay, who had strong differences with Jackson. 
Jackson attacked King Caucus and supporting the right of the people to choose their own president and received the most of the popular votes. The election resulted in no one winning an electoral majority, and the election was thrown into the House of Representatives to decide of the top three candidates, Jackson, Adams, and Crawford. Now, as we see as the electoral results in the popular vote, Jackson had the popular vote, but the popular vote does not elect a person president. It's the electoral college that elects a person as president. And according to the Constitution, Jackson, Adams, and Crawford will be decided in the House of Representatives. Henry Clay did not garner enough percentage of the votes of the electoral vote to make the cut. Once the election was thrown into the House, each state got one vote, regardless of how their citizens voted. In the end, John Quincy Adams won the presidency. Although he had lost a popular vote and had come in second to Jackson on the electoral vote, he nominated his fellow candidate in 1824, Henry Clay, who was also Speaker of the House, to be his Secretary of State. As most past presidents had served as Secretary of State, and Secretary of State, as we've seen, has been a springboard to the presidency. Jefferson was Secretary of State under Washington. Monroe Madison was Secretary of State under Jefferson. Monroe was Secretary of State under Madison. And John Quincy Adams was Secretary of State under James Monroe. As Jackson perceived this as a corrupt bargain and struck by the two whereby Clay would use his influence in the House to secure Adams the presidency, and Clay in turn would be his heir apparent. As a result, Jackson did not receive the required majority of electoral votes. Jackson received 99 electoral votes, Adams had 84, Crawford 41, and Clay 37. Calhoun had received 182 electoral votes and was elected as vice president. With the election being settled in the House of Representatives between the three highest vote getters, thus eliminating Clay, who then backed Adams. The state legislature of Kentucky was instructed their representatives in the House to vote for Jackson, but Clay convinced them to vote for Adams instead. And in February of 1825, Adams received 13 votes to Jackson's seven and Crawford's four. The election of Adams ended the Virginia dynasty. The corrupt bargain was the nickname given by Representative George Kramer of Pennsylvania, discharged Clay in an unsigned letter, with making a corrupt bargain before the House vote. When Adams offered Clay the position of the Secretary of State, the charge was given credence, and a charge repeated by Jackson all the way up through the next presidential election. John Quincy Adams Adams believed that the federal government should finance a national transportation network, create a great national university in Washington, D.C., and support scientific explorations of the West, and build an astronomical observatory, and establish a Department of Interior to manage the extensive government-owned lands. National Republicans and Democrats newspapers said Adams was behaving like an aristocratic tyrant and Congress revealed that it, it would not approve of his proposals. Due to his presidency, Democratic-Republican Party split, creating a new party called National Republicans, then in the opposition named themselves Democrats. They were the strongest in the South and the West, as well as the working class in large eastern cities. The Democrats were the first party to recruit professional state organizers, such as Martin Van Buren of New York City. And party loyalty became the most powerful weapon to Democrats could muster against the privileged aristocracy. Critics said Adams sometimes was known as the old men eloquent and had the depth and breadth of a diplomatic experience that helped cause him to be ranked among the top diplomats. His presidency, however, was undermined by many of Jackson's supporters who portrayed him as an aristocratic elitist and out of touch with the needs of the common man. After his one-term presidency, 
Adams briefly retired to Massachusetts and then was elected to the House of Representatives. He was the only former U.S. president to serve in this capacity after the presidency. He became famous for his fight against the gag rule, which said you could not speak about slavery in Congress, and for being a staunch abolitionist. The Tariff of 1828 The Tariff of 1824 did not stop British competition with wool growing and wool and textile interest. Northeastern interest introduced a bill in 1827 to substantially raise import duties that make the importation of those articles virtually prohibited. Although the bill passed the House, Vice President John C. Calhoun cast the decisive vote in the Senate, agreeing with the anti-terror force. This created the Harrisburg Convention, where 100 delegates from 13 states met from July to August 19, 1827 and called for higher duties, generally a minimum valuation principle on textiles, in addition to duties on hemp, flax, hammered bar iron, and steel and other goods. In the South, there was opposition, because the South depended on the world market for disposal of agricultural commodities, and imposed a protective tariff because it caused an increase in manufacturing goods. Thomas Cooper, in a speech in Columbia, South Carolina, condemned the economic ambitions of the North as a menace to Southern equality in the Union, and suggested that the South would reevaluate its role in the Federal Union, facing either submission or separation. The Tariff of Abominations. In May 1828, the dominant Jacksonian faction in the 20th Congress exploited the tariff issue to discredit President Adams, expecting New England vote to back Adams and Southerners to agree with Jackson. The Jacksonians submitted a tariff on January 31, 1828, with such high duties, there's no way a section was going to expect to vote for it. Adams would then get blamed for the defeat of the measures, and the protectionist in Pennsylvania steel industry would be aligned with alienated from Adams. Middle state and Southern Alliance would vote down every attempt to amend the tariff, expecting for it to be defeated. When it was finally put to the vote, the measure passed the House 105 to 94, and the Senate 25-21, raising the tariff to its highest levels before the Civil War. Because it embodied the principle of protected tariffs, New England legislatures voted for it despite its deficiencies. To the Jacksonian surprise, Western and Middle State Jacksonians voted for the measure as well to deprive the Clay Adams faction of a campaign issue. John C. Calhoun wrote the South Carolina Exposition and Protest in 1828, where he declared that a state could nullify an act of Congress that it found unconstitutional, such as the new tariff. The South Carolina Resolves, the South Carolina legislature passed eight resolutions calling the tariff unconstitutional, oppressive, and unjust, and they were joined in protests from Mississippi, Georgia, and Virginia. The South Carolina Exposition and Protest stated that with the resolutions was a lengthy essay written but not signed by Vice President John C. Calhoun espousing the theory of state sovereignty and minority rights. Calhoun formally abandoned nationalism, maintaining that states possessed the right to determine if acts of Congress were constitutional or not, and states' doctrines, rights doctrine. With it, Calhoun identified himself with the particular views of states and his section. Democrats. Andrew Jackson was nominated by the Tennessee legislature on October 1825. He resigned his Senate seat to run for president. Vice President John C. Calhoun was placed on the ticket with Jackson. The National Republicans in Harrisonburg, Pennsylvania nominated John Quincy Adams for a second term and Adam Richard Rush of Pennsylvania for vice president. During the campaign, Adams supporters denounced Jackson as a hot-tempered, ignorant barbarian, a gambler, and a slave trader who's right on violence. He resisted as a cold-blooded killer. They also claimed that Jackson lived in adultery with his wife. 
the fact that they did not live together as husband and wife for two years in the mistaken belief that their her divorce from her first husband had been complete. As soon as the divorce was official, Adams and Rachel remarried to end all doubts of their status. Jackson blamed Clay for spreading the slurs. The Jacksonians also condemned Adams as an aristocrat and a monarchist, a career politician that never held a real job and been corrupted by the courts of Europe. They even claimed that Adams' time as ambassador to Russia, he acted as a pimp, delivering young girls to serve as the last czar Alexander I. Jackson was seen as the people's champion by farmers, the working class, and as a planter, lawyer, and slaveholder, he had the trust of Southern political elite. Jackson believed in small government, individual liberty, and expanded military and white supremacy. Adams supporters referred to Jackson as a jackass. The jackass will become the symbol of the Democratic Party. Democrats attacked on personal grounds that their opponents reiterated in kind that the corrupt bargain charge was used effectively against Adams and Clay. And Jackson was hailed as a military hero, champion of the common man, and supporter of the American system. The common man in politics. Jackson's campaign appeal to the common voters, many of whom were able to vote in a presidential election for the first time. New Jersey, Maryland, and South Carolina had abolished property and tax paying requirements in order to vote. After 1815, then states of Indiana, Illinois, Alabama, and Mississippi gave voting rights to all white men, regardless of property. In 1824, 21 of 24 states had dropped the property requirements. This democratization of politics also affected many free black males in northern states, half of which were now allowed to vote. Jackson, as a frontier man of humble origins and limited education, who scrambled up the political ladder by sheer tenacity, symbolized this democratic ideal. Labor politics. The working class became an important political force in the form of the Working Men's Party organization in 1828 in Philadelphia. The Working Man's Party also was in favor of compulsory education. In other words, all children should have to attend free public school. They also called for the ending of imprisoning people in debt and supported a 10-hour workday. And union members loved Andrew Jackson. The results of the election 1828, Jackson carried 647,231 popular votes, 178 electoral votes to Adams 509,097 popular votes, 83 electoral votes. Calhoun was re-elected to vice president with 171 electoral votes. The crucial states of Pennsylvania and New York both went for Jackson. In New York, Jackson received 140,763 votes to Adams 135,413 votes with the support of Martin Van Buren and William L. Marcy. New York leaders who had gained control over the old Republican machine and maintained power by exercising the spoil system. The retirement of John Quincy Adams. Adams had served as ambassador, senator, secretary of state, and one term as U.S. president. Following his defeat for re-election in 1831, Adams returned for 17 years to the House of Representatives from Massachusetts, earning the nickname Old Man Eloquent. He fiercely opposed the expansion of slavery, seeking to limit its movement into the newer states. In 1848, he suffered a stroke in Congress and died a few hours later. His ghost is said to roam the House chamber still. Ooh. And so ends our study of nationalism and sectionalism.